So welcome to the conversation, the last one, on Sunday at 4 with Boris Mikhailov and uh, Vita Mikhailov and the Russian translator who will help us to make this conversation precise and lively at the same time. Welcome, Boris. Welcome, Vita. Thank you very much for coming. Uh, <coughs> Boris and I, we have some uh, we have some history together. We made uh, in 2000 an exhibition called Remake Berlin. Can we? Sorry. Oh, you're, oh, you're starting. Okay. We, are, uh, <coughs> uh, we made an exhibition called Remake Berlin, trying to think about what, how Berlin changes um, in. Um, uh, during, uh, since 1989, I have to get accustomed to the, the translator too, if I realize. And we wanted Boris Mikhailov, who at that time started to live in Berlin, to be part of that exhibition. And we asked him to be part of it, we got to know each other, we like each other, but he seemed not really to join in, so we kind of made, we kind of give him a commission. We asked him to photograph football in Berlin. We knew that he, uh, th um, until then he didn't work so much as a photographer in the West. He was well known already, not so well known that he is today as uh, this famous photographer from the East now living in the West. We asked him to photograph uh, uh, football in Berlin and we thought he's going to photograph uh, Hertha Berlin or he's going to photograph Dynamo Berlin, the football clubs, but then the season was over, he has not even started, and he actually started to photograph. So my first question to you, Boris, is how did you, how did you, how did you um, feel about this commission? How was it to start uh, in the West to photograph? How, did you, how was it for you to start in Berlin this work uh, with football? Во-первых, я хочу сказать, почему ты мне дал футбол? I wanted to ask, why did you ask me to do football? I love basketball. <laughs> uh, first questions. What's answer? Uh, and I never see big people football. We go with, with my wife in other city, and I'm one time, it was last, last season, last time, last picture. But we have some before was picture. Uh, ah, you can I'm talk sorry, in Russian. Sorry, yeah, yeah. But we had, we had just the possibility to go there and take a picture. And we took a picture there. The rest of it was done at home. Actually, can I, can you give me the picture? No, not that. No. <laughs> Actually, at the time, uh, we just got this uh, ability to go, and so we wanted to go and do the photographs. And uh, we actually just did one or two pictures, and then we went home and did everything at home. Ну, наверное, наверное, это не важно. Главное, что просто опустили футбол до, до низа. Домашний, домашний футбол, он как бы лучше стал, чем тут большой. Well, basically, what we wanted to do was see football at its lowest level. So we went down to the home teams, the local teams, mm -hmm. and that was the most interesting for us. Но самое главное, что потом картинки такие, как мы сделали, начали использовать другие художники и фотографы. Это вот уже было приятно. И там сами мы просто смогли немножко раскрутиться. But the, the most interesting thing was, as you see in these pictures here, that what we did, the example we gave, was then copied by other artists and photograph, uh, photographers, and that was photographers, and that was what became very interesting was to see how they interpreted our take on it. Uh, for example, here in these pictures, you see why why would we use a, a pregnant woman? Well, she was pregnant. That's all. So we took that picture. Uh, it's round. It's round like the ball. So there you go. Ну, это главное, что потом было взято, показано на Украине, показано хорошо в лучшем музее. For us, the most important thing was that we got this opportunity that we did the pictures, and those were very successful, and we actually got to show them in Ukraine as well that way, and we were in the best museums. And for us, this was a first step. Was it for you kind of the start of taking pictures in the West? I know, I remember that you had 
Not an easy time. You lost your context, uh, your background when you moved to the West. Вообще я не знаю, что такое контекст, хорошо. Но Well, I, I agree, but I mean, I don't really know what you mean by context in, in the first place. <laughs> if you move out your hometown, if you move out of the <laughs> Soviet... <coughs> if you don't know the answer, we move over to Vita. She is the second person to give us answers. If you move out of your hometown, if you move out of your political system, if you move, if you move out of your language, of, of your understanding and smelling a situation and you are in a new town where, you, where the smell is strange, your way of acting must be different. I I actually, yeah, I actually get that. I was joking, but basically, what I started with was the premise of taking something that was uh, carried uh, very high to a lower level. And you're right. I mean, it was a difficult thing to change context. We move now back to yeah, your I, early... I, I would like to say, yeah. Boris is a street photographer. He's from, from like sty old style. And he <coughs> continue taking picture every day and, and never and never uh, go out from home without camera. And, yeah. and, uh, yeah. and this is not possible to say that uh, till football he did not do anything. <laughs> and he took yeah. picture and even, even this picture later came to a collection to Berlinish Gallery and this is good picture. <laughs> but, this is, but football is good serial. We will get this again. So, uh, Boris, uh, <coughs> we go back to your beginnings. How do you, uh, sorry for asking this silly question uh, to someone who has worked for 40 or 50 years, but how did you come to take pictures? I know that you were not a professional photographer. You didn't have first an education as a photographer. So if I remember well, you were kind of an engineer. How did you come that you, entered the field of photography. We, we actually were talking before the show, you were going to ask me some other things, but... was <laughs> И мне дали, организовал сделать какую-то лабораторию, кино. И там сделали кино. Но первая картинка, которая у меня получилась, которая получилась, фотографии просто, получился по тому времени в Харькове шедевр такой. Женщина шаит сигаретой. Вот женщин снимали, а женщина сигареты не снимали. Ну как бы не принято. И я понял, что можно снимать в этом направлении. Это как бы одна. И другие варианты там социального. То есть как бы я почувствовал, что там я могу провести себя что-то. Well, actually, you're right. I mean, it is an interesting thing because it kind of happened by chance. Um, it, to be honest, being an engineer was quite boring. And uh, they gave me the opportunity to do something, a, a sort of laboratory, uh, to make my own workshop. And, and it was focused on uh, cinema, actually. Uh, but then I took a photo, a sort of classic, became a classic photo in Kharkiv history of, of the arts, was a woman smoking a cigarette. And the fact is, at the time, women smoking cigarettes was not a theme that was a really approved of in photography. And I realized that I had a social theme there that was going, that interested me. And that was when it sort of started up. But it's interesting to explain these pictures. So they are very, 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 Вот это, например, какая-то странная, можно даже сказать, агли какое-то такое, да? Следующая женщина нормальная, а следующая женщина возвышенная. То есть у меня есть возможность, получается, по этому символу, снимать варианты женщин, в котором есть все. Well, I did I want to talk about this um, in, in more detail, those pictures, because at that time, and Orson, in fact, you've 
done a book uh, around this theme as well. Uh, those uh, pictures that I took at the time became sort of epigraphs. That is, they contained in themselves the entire meaning of the work in which they are enclosed. And what I thought was that uh, I was able to do pictures of women of all different kinds. And those very different women in different poses could be normal women, could be exceedingly exceptional women, or women in different types of situations. And that was what got to me, that, that, the, uh, that you could carry that theme, that theme through all of these different posi positions. Uh, mm. еще now it's me. These paintings he put in two. First he put in two. And at the same time he said that it's a montage. So we can see a very strange woman, or I don't know how to call it, or Lenin, also strange. It's a very strange combination. So it means that it's a woman and a man. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <laughs> um, so as you can see, in fact, the, the way that these pictures were positioned, the photos were positioned, they're done one by one, uh, two by two, that is. And together, this co comes forward as a kind of montage, almost, uh, that you can see a strangeness and a normalness next to each other. And that composition was what became a kind of signature, a kind of interesting aspect we, of the work. We did uh, start this <coughs> retrospective catalog or retrospective book we did together. Yeah. Maybe you can go one image back. No, the other way around. It's the red. <laughs> we started the book actually with these two images, and it's interesting to talk about this. You, you already started. It's uh, if you if you look at these two images, uh, I think you can really talk about the how your way of taking pictures, how your way of looking at the world in the Ukraine uh, was disrespectable to the Soviet system. These two images contain actually the resistance of your way of looking at the world already. And I think it's interesting for all of us if you explain this resistance along these two images, if you are so kind. Да, я согласен, да. Но это не все. Конечно, это один из главных элементов, который здесь есть. А второй элемент, там есть женщина. Вот следующая картинка. Покажите, пожалуйста. Как бы здесь раз, это распространяется на многое. Это быт, быт опущенный ниже. То есть что такое? Это прекрасная, это женщина и это яйцо. Яйцо и мужчина. Такая опять связь. Но связь уже на другом варианте идет. Это вариант быта. И быт, и память. То есть здесь в советском все есть. Там и память есть, и антисоветская есть. И, и какое-то даже, даже то, что вообще в принципе не говорили. Я, вот сейчас только я достал, что за дурные картинки. А оказалось, там есть еще была какая-то мечта. Мечта о какой-то другой жизни. О том, вот следующий кадр. А вот это, да, вот у нее, она прекрасно сидит, и вот эта меч, ее мечта, она, она фактически и сделала новую жизнь. Mm -hmm. Вот это новое, что я вот сейчас, когда пришлось нам э, делать как бы эту выставку, то получилось, что эту часть как бы советскую, не, она не отражалась. Вот это мне хотелось бы сейчас сказать. То есть, и, э, то есть если рассмотреть вот э, тот контекст, как говорилось, извиняюсь, я долго говорю. Mm -hmm. We have to give the translator <laughs> a chance to <laughs> translate. Yes, well, what you said is true about the elements of anti-Sovietism, the elements of my attitude toward that system and rebellion towards it. But that's not all. That was one element. But the other element, as you see in the next picture of the woman uh, here, is to take daily life, that is everything that, that we consider as a daily routine part of our lives, and juxtapose it with other types of very high materials, and very high reference points, as you see here. So for example, the woman with the egg, this is a, a variant of that where the daily life and the, th the theme of memory and what was considered high and what was considered just daily routine and, and, and uh, everyday life, those are mixed. So there is an aspect of anti-Sovietism, there is that. And you could look at the pictures today and say, well, these are sort of idiotic, except that you know, at the time, there was also an element of what was a dream, an aspiration and what was another life that one could aspire to. So that dream is part of it. And the anti-Sovietism and, and those things, the anti-Soviet rhetoric uh, becomes a new life, a new opportunity. Was this already clear for you in the 70s? Or 
became it clearer for you later on only. No, I just thought it up now, actually. <laughs> Но, но самое важное, действительно, вот недавно, что вот я подумал там, что важно было, важно было то, что понять, что такое советское. Советское – это все время среднее. среднее. И советское в искусстве отрезало верхнюю часть, где прекрасная жизнь, и нижнюю часть, где ужасная жизнь. И вот, это, и, и вот получается для человека как бы андеграунда, который не связан ни с какими, ни с продажами, ни с журналом, который посылает тебя сделать то или другое, ты можешь делать какую-то вещь, которая не, не связана с этими данными. И, и, тогда, и вот следующий, потом в следующей серии, которую я покажу, как бы оно и связано будет вот с этими, э, ни, с нижней частью. Но там есть одна очень интересная вещь, которая тоже хотелось бы, не знаю, как сказать. Есть фотографическая, обычная фотографическая фотографическая методика. Ты снимаешь красивые вещи, идешь от красивой вещи, и она снимается. А другая часть, которая у меня получилась, и, и, и вот эта часть, которая сделала меня кем-то, вот эта вот часть, которая связана с этими бутербродами. Uh -huh. То есть я нечаянно сложил два слайда вместе, две пленки. И эти пленки дали сразу на просвет, на просвет 36, 36 изображений. Uh -huh. Uh, yes, well, that's, it's very important, and that was part of the way I was uh, perceiving things at the time. And, and with a very important theme was, what is Soviet? What is Soviet? Well, Soviet is everything mediocre, average. The very high themes are discarded. The very moral high themes or grounds are discarded. And the very low or vulgar themes are also cut away. So you just have this ongoing uh, grayness. There's no elegance. There's no vulgarity. It's all cut away. So for someone of the underground, as I was at the time, the important thing, I wasn't connected to any journals. I didn't have any professional references that I had to respect. So I could go and do what I wanted, unconnected to that reality of mediocrity. And it was that connection. And one of the things I did next was I went to the lower depths. And I went to look at uh, this very important thing uh, that became, um, if you will, uh, a photographic method. But photographic method at the time wasn't looking at those things. Photographic method at the time for us was just you go and photograph beautiful things and then you show them to people. What I wanted to do and what made me who I am today was going away into another realm and going lower and looking at the depths. There is, um, there is an interesting... We're talking now about the relation... I, I hadn't finished actually. And, and that was when we got to the period of what we call the, the sandwiches or the overlay period when I had different films, more or less by chance, that got crossed over while we were doing the developing, and we saw 36 very interesting different images. Yeah. And it was from there that I drew this overlay or sandwich theme. Да. И в чем метод особенный получается здесь? Я мог ходить и снимать все, что вокруг меня есть. И чем больше я разных предметов сниму, тем больше вариантов этих сналожений будет. То есть это соединится с этим или с этим. А я потом только буду отбирать. У меня ничего в голове нет. У меня пустая голова. И вот этот, вот, вот этот метод, фо это фотографический метод. Я ничего как художник не придумываю. Я только хожу и снимаю, поливаю все. И потом поливая все, закручиваю и посмотрю, как фотограф. Ток-ток, это хорошо, это хорошо. И так далее. What was interesting I found about this method was that it freed me to just photograph everything I saw and use it. Everything I saw, I took photographs of because as I laid them one over the other, a bit like a Rubik's Cube, it just gave me more and more variants of what I could do with. And this is what I call photographic, purely photographic method. I left my head free, empty, while I took those pictures. And then I used the photographic method to introduce the artist's side and to look at what this meant uh, as a photograph and as a photographic possibility. There is the relation between your photography and the Soviet system. But there is also the relation between today, for the last 20, 20 30 years, the, Euro, the relation between your photography, photography and the West, or how the West looks at your photography. For example, I know that these sandwich images, which you really like and are very important for you, they don't make your, the way so easily into 
the understanding of the West. I think we have from the West maybe a different opinion about you than you have about yourself, because we, have a, we talk and look at your pictures out of a different context. Нет, это действительно трудный вопрос и много, и очень много, много значащий, потому что как бы трудно понять, как действительно работает на Западе та или работа, та или другая работа. Я могу сказать, что вот эта верхняя часть айсберга о советской жизни, она вообще не рассматривается Западом, она рассчитывается, она вообще никем не рассматривается и вообще не рассматривалась. А рассматривалась большей частью та часть, которая, которая тяжелая, которая действительно ближе к Западу. В чем здесь близость? Советская близость, она как бы основана на умилении. Советское искусство, оно основано на умилении. Вот солдат а рядом кошечка лежит. Вот тут все равно, даже есть солдат, он умилился. А иностранное, там, это, это, это должно быть, это, это серьезно. Например, Аппельт или другие фотографы, или там, ну, все, все это серьезно, это содрогание. Это не умиление, а содрогание. Поэтому, конечно, вот это мое еще состояние, связанное с какими-то советскими или русскими традициями, оно работало, и поэтому не все было принято. Well, yeah, in, in a sense, you're right. I mean, I think uh, what, what you have, uh, it's a very important question, the one you just, uh, you just gave, because there's a different meaning. And, and I didn't know how this lexicon in the West worked necessarily. Um, the Soviet, the sort of Soviet side, the Soviet culture side, is just the tip of the iceberg, really. Uh, what you have in, in, in that sense is something that no one in the West was truly considering at the time or looking at closely with regards to the Soviet system, as I was doing. Uh, in the West, they only looked at the hardest part, the, the, the very uh, carcass, uh, the of the, of the Soviet system. And uh, the Soviet system of imagery was based quite often on a sort of sweetness, uh, a revealed sweetness, uh, and, and you might have a soldier looking at a cat who looked a little bit, it looked a little bit cute, um, and he was, he was getting softened by that. Whereas in the West, everything was quite serious, quite hard, if you look at the photographers of that, that time. So that was not the way that I was going or the way that I was brought up, the, the culture I brought to it. Uh, I still had some of those Soviet and Russian, I would say, traditions in my work uh, that informed my work at the time. Да, еще одно важное. Эти картинки все были в слайдах. Я их смог напечатать только тогда, когда приехал на Запад. Mm -hmm. И поэтому они как бы не были, они не были в продукте, в предмете. Mm -hmm. и, и, и они, не, когда попали на Запад, они уже как бы, это, этот стиль уже был не так интересен, потому что в это время реальность захватила позиции, реально было важно. Вот это, и, и, и они просто не вовремя пришлись. Но теперь они сюда, там идут. В принципе, э, даже сейчас можно видеть наложение э, в культуре, очень часто идущие фотографии. So it, another thing that's important to remember at the time was that all of my work was contained on slides. And those slides were only printed for the first time and became an actual object of art in the West. And by the time that actually happened, by the time those images were productized, uh, the West was, the reality was catching up with my interpretation of it in the Soviet system. And the West was then interested in that hard reality as opposed maybe to the images I had been thinking of and producing prior to that. Um, now, of course, there's a return to that uh, with interest, uh, what, I've been, what I was doing at the time. But at the time, it was perhaps hard for the West to appreciate. Did the West ever like the sweet part in this sandwich series? Or does the West still have the problem with beauty and sweetness in art? We could ask you, because I remember exhibition, and this is part was a big discussion, and you, uh, uh, at the first, you, um, you was uh, uh, against of this, ex uh, of this part, and Boris told no, or this part, or any exhibition, if you remember. And then I remember your email when you, uh, when you wrote, and then you more and more look through this picture, you like, um, I don't want to say, like, fall in, fall in love more and more to these images. And this is maybe a question to you. <laughs> I can't сейчас, 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 сейчас. Я еще добавлю, еще. Я еще can, добавлю. Yes, yes. I cannot remember. Не помню. No, no. Don't believe them. It's not true. It's not true. Тогда я докажу. Тогда я докажу, что это так. 
I can prove it. I can я докажу, it. потому что эти картинки как раз с выставки купили. No, the most important thing was because what happened was those photos were sold. Those were sold at the uh, exhibit. Uh, by actually, you at that we actually exhibit. sold the series <laughs> out, out, of the, out of a museum's exhibition to a collector. But I must admit, uh, right, uh, Vita is right. When I saw this series first, I had a problem with, with it. I, was a, I had a problem with this voluptuous surrealism in it. Which was quite, quite, quite surprising around 2000. This voluptuous surrealism, and and even even going a little bit too far, we always tend, as uh, whatever in our Western bourgeois uh, culture, to to reduce things. And he is always going a little bit too far. So I had troubles to accustom, or at least I needed, as you said, I needed time to get into it. And then it became finally it became a series I liked a lot. But it was not not the case right, at the beginning. Ой, правильно, совершенно правильно, потому что потом оказалось, что вот этот стиль, он должен был как бы быть против скучности советской фотографии, фотографии и живописи. Скучная, а скучность, она как бы она была связана с а скучность была связана с вот с этим средним И поэтому вот этот нахальный стиль, он был тогда там и работал. Yeah, actually, absolutely right. Because in fact, that style that I was developing, it was developed on purpose. As you said, I was going a bit far, and it was developed as a reaction against the boringness, the the, the mediocrity of the Soviet system, both the photographic uh, milieu and the the painterly and artistic milieu in general. And so, yes, it was up against that. And, and that was why I had to develop it in that way at the time, yeah. We have to move on to the, also according to time, we have to finish at five for train reasons. Um, we have to move on to the Red series. I think, uh, I think the 70s uh, in Russia and Ukraine, you were born and raised and lived in Kharkov. Uh, the 70s are different to the 80s. Before we enter the Red series, I would love to know you, can you describe the mood in the 70s in the Soviet Union and the mood in the 80s? I think, if I remember well, you distinctly said they, they, are, they were different in the mood. Настроения разные. Вот Кабаков, например, говорил, сейчас есть художник Кабаков, и он выступал в Москве, и он говорил, как мы жили противно. И все. А вдруг на него налетели, как мы противно жили. Мы замечательно жили, там другие. То есть здесь только опять-таки мы говорим о том, что есть разные позиции, разные, серьез... разные отношения к этому делу. Моя позиция была такая. Я видел красное, и оно меня, было... оно меня дергало. Мне это было вот так, оно чересчур, но нельзя. Красоту, красота и, и, и красное в русском это одно и то же. И, и это все время давило, и красное давило, и красота давила. Well, it's interesting because, you know, just recently Kabakov is an artist, uh, many of you may know. Kabakov was speaking in Moscow and he was saying about those years that you're just mentioning, that we lived really horribly, really, I mean, it was just terrible. And others said, you know what, actually, it was great. We lived an exceptional lifestyle at the time, um, probably meaning as artists. But it's just to show that there were many different positions on that same period of time, lots of different views. And I think my personal relationship was simply drawn by that color, that red, that overwhelming red everywhere. Um, as many know, uh, red and beauty in Russian have the same root, kras. Uh, and uh, and that's one word. That, that was sort of too overwhelming for me. I had to do something about it. The главное, как бы, вот до сих тут если говорить о годах, которые жили, я не буду говорить, что хорошо или плохо. Странно было. Сейчас вспоминать об этом удивительно. Не знаю даже как. Но я уже забыл, что хотел. А семидесятых. Значит, в чем тогда можно сказать? Так подытожить. Подытожить. 70-е годы – это время диссидентов, время мысли диссидентские. Вот эта вот вещь, в принципе, нельзя было показывать, она была опасна. И, и потом меня приглашали, когда я показывал это, меня приглашали, там, куда КГБ называется. А, да? Yeah, well, I mean, I'm not going to say whether it was good or bad. In fact, for me, 
it's kind of weird trying to remember that period, trying to go back in my memory to that time. Um, but what I can say is, uh, to sum up the 70s, this was a time of in, in intelligentsia dissidents, right? This was a time of thinking people who were dissident, and it was a dangerous theme, and you couldn't show it, you couldn't talk about it. In fact, I once started showing a bit about it, and I was invited for a little discussion uh, at the KGB. So that's the way it was. Before we go to the Red Series, my question also to you is, uh, but you couldn't show these photographs. Could you, pu you couldn't publish them at that time? You couldn't show these photographs. So did you, do, did you all do all these photographs and pack them in boxes and had them under your bed until you moved to Berlin? That was, it was what we called kitchen culture. So you, you would show things on your kitchen table to people who cared, uh, and people would get a uh, knowledge of it, and they would go from place to place and talk about what you were doing. That was the only way. Privately, that is. И еще одно, значит, когда в чем тогда вот эти все серии, не все серии, здесь уже вот как как идет развитие фотографии в том месте для меня. То есть это вот эта серия, она как бы говорит действительно уже о чем-то нашем. Я буду называть наша и за и и их западная, да. То есть это как бы уже начинается понимание того, что это здесь так, а а на Западе что-то другое должно быть. Но первое, но yeah, I think one of the things that this, this series of photographs, which I just summarize in this way, about the development of pho photography and my method. What, just one last question to the red series sure. is, if I, what does the red, the red had different meanings. The red had not only one meaning in Soviet Union. I think uh, red had uh, a multitude of meanings. Maybe you can mention a few of them for the public. Uh, for me, red had just one meaning, uh, as we would say as we would say in, in, in Ukrainian, the, the, the way we would say it is, it just overfilled everything. Yeah. It was everywhere. Это ощущение, оно как бы, это, это ощущение, но от него надо отойти тоже. То есть, если ты хочешь двигаться куда-то еще и понять, что делается вокруг, тебе эти ощущения тоже будут мешать. Через некоторое время тебе надо от них отойти. И вот эта вот следующая серия, которую покажем, это, наверное, вот это называется «Бич», где моя подруга от меня ушла, и я почувствовал, что, боже мой, у меня на меня советская больше не влияет. И на меня влияет эта жизнь, которая вокруг и, и я подошел уже к другому пониманию что такое жизнь это как бы это ну другое другое понимание жизни What's interesting is that uh, that feeling, even that feeling about red or whatever, uh, after a while you have to give up and, and let it go. You have to let it go and go on to other, th other things, go further. Uh, over time, that's inevitable that that will happen, and indeed it did happen to me. Uh, it's, got to, it's got to give you, uh, it's, you've got to take your freedom from it. And, and that I did, and uh, there I was on this beach where uh, my, my girlfriend left me, as it were. I realized all of a sudden that it was life that interested me and that that, Soviet, uh, that theme had dropped, dropped away from me. It no longer had influence on me. It just came to me that I had another vocation, another way to go. And that's how this series that we're looking at now began. So we came to the fact that Это снимается средний человек. Если раньше я был реакция как бы диссидентская какая-то или, или негативная, я от, решалось отношение между хорошим и плохим, то теперь уже как бы решается другое. Кто мы такие? Где мы живем? Как, как понять, где мы живем? Мы же не, не имеем входа на Запад. Uh -huh. И вот здесь мы нашли, вот нашлась эта картинка, которая, если вот не честно, снимаешь, 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 и вдруг увидел эту картинку, которая потом. Это оказалась американская жизнь которая похожа на американскую жизнь много лет назад. Значит, получается, что мы сейчас живем так, как американцы жили тогда. 
So what was interesting was that when this happened, I suddenly found myself taking pictures, and, and this picture of the average guy came out. Came, that started to become the theme. Uh, if you consider that before, what I was doing was I was involved with dissidents, with sort of exceptional dissident people. Uh, uh, now, the theme was no longer good versus bad or, or, or what's going to happen about that, but it transformed itself into who are we today? Where do we live? What are we doing with our time, and 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 what is our you know our uh, our daily life? And I took thousands and thousands of these pictures, and suddenly popped up this guy, and it turned out to be something that looked strangely like American life, but many years ago. So we were living we were living this sort of U.S. life, but in the in in today, but f resembling American life many, like many years ago. Like a retarded American life in on the Black Sea. You can see it. There it is. Да. Вот интересно здесь про вот по этой вот серии первая картинка. Это еще раз повтори. Repeat, repeat, repeat. Go back to the first, the first photo. Вот не первое. Это украинская жизнь. This is Ukrainian life. Ukrainian life. Here. Next. Next. This is like Lenin state. This is like people who not. Это как человек, который не умеет отдыхать. Он даже ногу не положил куда надо. Вот он лежит, но ему неудобно. Но он даже не поймет, что ему надо хорошо лечь. This is this is just these different images. Like if you look at this guy, this is a guy who doesn't even know how to relax. He doesn't know how to lie on a on a beach bench. You know, he's got his leg in an uncomfortable position. He doesn't give a damn. He's just lying there. No. Yes. It looks, it looks perfect. It looks perfect of someone who we will never really enjoy and relax life. We go on to the next series and show this Sotsad series. Maybe you can give a comment to that beautiful series. В общем, это как бы э, это тоже серия, которая уже, э, уже оторвалась от фотографии и пришла к художнику, как бы, как бы не, уже не фотограф работает, уже как бы художник работает, концеп, какая-то концептуальность. В чем здесь смысл? Я работал фотографом обычным, ко мне приходили люди, приносили мне фотографии, я их увеличивал, потом раскрашивал, а потом продавали. Такая была работа. Но я собирал, и я собирал вот эти варианты, варианты, которые мне нравились. Эти варианты казались чисто совет, жизни советских, советской жизни. Эти картинки были в любом советском доме, потому что цветной фотографии не было, а потребность в ней была. И вот эти... Э, и, и получилось так, что это уже как бы, как будто бы я уже представлял, если я, эта коллекция, она, не, ну вот эти картинки, которые я накрасил, они как бы представляли собой уже как бы люди заказывали их и покупали. Это как бы, это как бы любовь и это любовь народа. Получается, я представляю уже весь народ. То есть через меня уже идет такое дело. Хотя здесь полный идиотизм, конечно, дурь такая. Well, it's an interesting series, because in fact what happened was um here, after leaving the Soviet theme behind, I came back to it, but already not as a photographer, but as an artist in a different way, a conceptualist approach here. Because the, the photographs that you see here, these were photographs that people would come to me and give me uh, these photographs. Uh, they gave them to me and, and maybe they'd make an order, I would print them or color them and give them back and they would take them home. Uh, but I kept the ones that I liked best and all the ones I kept were directly related to that former Soviet life, that Soviet existence. And, and, and what's interesting is, um, at the time, all Soviet homes had these photographs in dozens, uh, but there was no color photography in the Soviet Union for, for family use. And so many people, there was a high demand for coloring of the photos, so I did that. But I also had a collection that I built up. Some of them were through these orders, and some of them were I would just pick out and, and keep for myself, and then develop them in this way, and, and color them in this way, to make them uh, of artistic value, and in a sense, the love of the people, all of that love that was in those photographs started coming through me. I mean, I had the love of the people in a sense. It's a silly thing to say, I know, but it felt like it was going through me and out into the world. 
Вот, например, эта карточка. Это мне принесли. Э, э, это мне принесли. Это человек хотел, чтобы его фотографировали вместе со Сталиным. Это стоит столько-то там и так далее. Это написано все. Это заказ. So this is this is a very typical example. The guy you see here, he wanted absolutely to have a photo of himself next to Stalin. So he came to me and he said, I'm, I'm ordering this. I, I want this. And I made this. I made that for him and then I made this. Но моя задача как бы продлить все это, ну продлить, использовать как бы это. Uh -huh. а, и использование как бы это метод такой. При... А? Нет, нет. Это метод такой uh -huh. как бы, когда ты можешь использовать эту дурную покраску и использовать ее в своих фотографиях. Это начинается, и там начинается как бы другая серия, которая, где я уже снимаю фотографии, которые мои фотографии, и начинаю раскрасывать их. So it, the interesting thing was that gave me this new method, if you will, uh, of managing these images in that way, and, and I took it further because uh, I found that you could use this approach of this extravagant coloring that I was doing um, in my own photos. That is, I took photos myself now and began coloring them as I had done by uh, for people on order before. So I made that into a new series that you're seeing now. It also seems... My, my last word on that. Um, well, what do I want to say? I mean, my last word on that is that one of the things I was doing with that extravagant coloring was I was kitchifying uh, the Soviet experience, the Soviet uh, cannons. And when you do that to the Soviet cannons, well, you're kind of getting them up the rear, as, as it were. Но одновременно все время играешь дурака, потому что как бы, а что, это красиво, это красиво. And, and then the, the way to get away with that and make it work is you pretend not to understand what you're doing. You're saying, oh, it's just, just got to be, I'm trying to make it pretty. But you did not only interfere with colors in, in the images, like in the Sotsart and the Lorike series, these wonderful series where you kind of uh, put the light on in black and white life of Soviet Union and make it colorful, but you also started to write into photo photographs. The writing is not so easy for us because it's your okay, really Russian yeah. writing, so we don't know right away what it means. But I would love to know why you started to write in it, and maybe you can, uh, whatever, read us one or two of these uh, uh, writings, for example, this one. Maybe you can read us, or you know by heart, what you have written under this photograph, this beautiful photograph of this uh, foolish man on the beach with, uh, with an umbrella that looks to be like a rainy umbrella, but it's unclear of if the sun is shining. Ну, сразу трудно сказать, сразу, но так точно. Если, если написать надо, и, может, получилось бы. Но а, вообще это идет все монтаж. Монтаж а, черного и цвета, монтаж картинки и картинки, монтаж текста и, а, текста и, а, и картинки. И вот эти разные варианты – это внутренняя потребность. Потребность этого, почему эта потребность существует? Потому что есть какое-то движение в этом. Движение, которое связано со временем. Было время, когда было спокойно, было, когда энергичная была реакция, а тут какая-то другая уже. Остановилось, время остановилось. Время Брежнева, Брежнева, она как бы сковала все. И картинки, они как бы, я смотрю картинки, они какие-то другие стали. И вот это, что они стали другие, ты начинаешь на них реагировать. И, и, и попробовал написать. А написал, смотри, а, ага, получилась вот такая-то связь. И получилась книга. Вот так получается текст. Когда идет это вот необходимо тут мне. It was actually, I have to tell you how to say how it exactly happened is, is very hard at this remove. But what I can say is that the, it, just this writing. Uh, became a part of what I needed to do. Um, it was a montage. It was 
uh, a process that came out of that process of montage of black and white and color, of pictures overlaid one on the other, and then text, uh, text being overlaid on it. And what was, it was new, it was something I had to do, it was an internal need I had, because of the movement it represented. You know, it was the Brezhnev time, uh, we had gone through some stable uh, times, and then some very ener energetic reactions to what was going on, but in Brezhnev's time, things seemed to stop, and there was a kind of need to be different, to react uh, to that. Um, and so this was the beginning of, of a new reaction, of, uh, and, and writing became part of that process, and writing became included in what I was thinking to express this and, uh, and to get it out. Uh, and that's how the book, this theme of the book came up, uh, and the book was then uh, with, with the images, I mean. In this case, you can get away from the красоты, которая... Или, вот как ты снимаешь? Видишь красивое, снимаешь. Или интересное видишь, снимаешь. А если... А вообще, как, как ты еще можешь снимать? Кроме того, что красивое, интересное. Как тебе оторваться от штампов? Вот э, это помогает текст. То есть ты придумал... Вот я меня, например, снял и текст. Меня здесь... У меня эту пленку засветили. У меня взяла полиция и засветила на базаре не снимать. Да? И вот у меня засветили, но кусочек остался, я написал об этом. Значит, у меня получилась картинка, уже которая не связана с красотой и с моим какой-то особой информацией. Это уже с текстом связано, это уже внутри. So uh, it's interesting because what happened was I wanted to break away from those, uh, um, those origins that I had, the photographic uh, methods that I was using in a sense. Uh, there was a need to break away from them. Uh, instead of just photographing what was interesting or what was beautiful, um, how could I take that further? And, and it turned out that text actually helps and that text intervenes in an interesting uh, way. And one of the examples here, as you see, uh, was I was on a marketplace and I was taking pictures and a policeman came up, grabbed the camera, pulled the film out and exposed it, or partly exposed it, and this was what was left. And so I decided I would write about that fact next to the images that were left. And there you have the result. So it, it became uh, part of, of what was important to, to, get, uh, to get expressed, to get out. And it was not just about beauty. And the text became part of the exercise. Вот это, например, картинка написана, иногда я застываю. И это у меня могут не отнять. So this picture, for example, says, sometimes I cool down or I slow down, and you can't take that away from me. Теперь я смотрю, почему я это написал, потому что есть такой опыт, когда курицу убивают, или как бы ее переворачивают головой вниз, на ровную кладут спиной, и она застывает. And, and why did I think uh, about this, uh, this sort of going still? I remember there was this uh, um, exercise or this maneuver that you could do with a chicken, where if you turned it in a certain way and put it on its back, it would just go still. Nothing happened, I just figured it couldn't be any worse with me, so just go still. We have to move forward a bit. Uh, yeah. We spend all the time with your be beautiful, interesting early work. So we are quietly, Boris, going through maybe this wonderful work, Unfinished Dissertation, uh, which I can only recommend you that please go to a library. This is one of the most beautiful books of Boris' entire career. It's done by the Scalo publisher, which uh, doesn't exist anymore. It's done in the 90s. It's a beautiful work, but we enter now the 90s. Uh, 90, you remember, 1989 is the, the big break, uh, the opening of the the Berlin Wall, the, the cut down of the Cold War, and we are getting into a completely different Ukraine. So I'm going forward, if Boris is not hindering me, I'm going forward to the so-called brown and blue series. But I'm not sure, maybe he will ask me to go back for a second. Let's see, no? No, it's still... Я извиняюсь, но это еще как бы относится к 80-м годам, там, где идет какая-то основа. Основа вот этих разработки языковых вариантов, связанных с фотографией. А, а это как бы фотографическая основа, моя фотографическая основа. Это то, что как бы, ну, моя, может быть, лучшая, одна из лучших фотографических серий. И мне хотелось бы ее просто представить. Um, actually, just to be, to be ac ab absolutely accurate, you were talking about 90s, but this also is uh, part of the 80s. It's part of the fundament. Uh, these pictures are part of the fundamental beginnings of a new language, uh, search for new photographic language. And it's very photographic 
uh, foundation for me. Um, and it's that series that you know I wanted to show now. I think it's a, a very f fundamental part. It's uh, it's anyway. Uh, see this series here. The, the what? How is it called? The it series. Is this is what we call the salt. This is what we call the Salt Lake in Ukraine. The salt Lake series, exactly. The salt Lake series, and you wonder what, in what kind of water these people are uh, are actually swimming. They, this photography looks so different. It looks so. Uh, I, I wonder even if you are influenced here by Western photography or by a, a kind of an ideal, what an ideal photo could be. Actually, it's, a, it's an interesting thing because my dad was born near here and used to bathe there in what we call the Salt Lake. And, uh, it is, it is a kind of uh, environmental commentary, but at the same time, it's the environment that is being patient with what we are doing to it, right? And uh, this was a series that um, I sort of I was maximizing my attention to the sort of very average Soviet person um, and what their daily life experiences could be. Then the 90s, the complete new time, capitalism enters uh, the East, I think that's about uh, how the game could have been called. Uh, and you made three incredible series, the so-called at, uh, at Dusk, the Blue series, At Ground, the, blue, the Brown series, and then this maybe most, cri most uh, discussed and also criticized series, Case History. I go roughly through it because we are running but, and we can maybe talk about these three series together. We are now in the brown series. That's an image I love a lot. It's just a wonderful picture. The beauty in within misery, but the lift beauty in within misery, not just a romantic one. You can answer while I'm going through, boys. I go back and forth, so we see you have time to see the images a bit. Oh well, we are okay. In an exhibition situation in Zurich, at the Kunsthalle in Zurich in the in the in the nineties of this series, now the blue series. То общество начало, ну, все стало хуже, все стало хуже. И коричневое это подразумевает то, что как бы мы начали идти не вверх по цивилизации, а как бы куда-то вниз, куда-то в прошлое. И действительно, те картинки, которые вначале были, они как, они тоже там можно узнавать было, но уже в одной картинке, не в ряду, которая делается, а в одной картинке можно было видеть сочетание советского и, и, и американского, или иностранного, или прошлого советского, опять с какими-то теперешними советскими. И вот эти варианты, которые дают нам, где мы находимся, что мы такое. Синяя серия, она, она уже она более, она показывает уже другое чувство. Она показывает чувство уже приближения к войне. Уже ассоциация уже двигается не назад, а вообще доходится до, почти до самого низа. И, в этой, и это ассоциация с войной, если синяя посмотреть. Homeless people, которая показана, это последняя серия, это последняя книга, ну, последняя книга этой серии, она как бы говорила о том, что да, вот это конец, это ноль. Это ноль всего, это то, что осталось от Советского Союза, и теперь еще не перешло, не перешло еще в капиталистизм, еще нет капитализма, еще как бы не получился еще он. Но э, и, и вот, это, вот это состояние тяжелое, оно как бы здесь передано. Передано, в общем, это вот, э, большими картинами, там двух, такие, как сейчас здесь лежат, такие большие. Почему большими? Потому что я чувствовал, что... Вот красивые картинки, это хорошо, это я их люблю, обожаю, но дело в том, что там большая проблема. Как же проблема показывать маленькими картинками, значит, их надо увеличивать, а он не хотел показывать большие. Окей. Well, actually, it's, uh, it's similar in a sense, you're right, uh, to what we were talking about before, the past uh, being present. 
it's uh, when the country sort of fell apart uh, and everybody ended up in this kind of hard scrabble, tough life existence. Uh, this was a society that was in, in retrograde. And the brown theme, or the, the sepia theme, that brown theme, is telling us that we're no longer on a trajectory going up in civilization as a country, as a, as a people. We're going down. We're going post-Soviet uh, time. We were going down very quickly. And you can see that in the series, and that's why it's in that, in that thing. I mean, you can see juxtaposed elements of Soviet and U.S. society, their commentaries on the time and inform that work. But it's also, uh, you see different pasts and presence of the Soviet system itself as well. And the interrogation I had was, where are we? Who are we? What are we going to become? Then the Blue series takes a different uh, point and, and, and is talking about how we're getting closer actually to a war footing, a war existence. Uh, and, and that was really the way it felt. We were going down to the bottom and that association of being at the uh, limit of what you could endure, like in a war situation. Finally, there was a series of um, what we would call homeless people that I took, and that was the last in these three books, the last in the triptych uh, of this series, and that was, we'd reached the zero point. We'd reached, uh, you know, uh, 100,000 degrees below zero. It was just the remnants of the Soviet system, the things that were not gonna be carried forward, the leftovers, as it were. There was no real capitalism yet, Life was becoming harder and harder, and we, we didn't really want to know, we didn't really know what was gonna happen. So I made these big, big pictures. And, and why did I make them big? Some people have asked me that. Um, it's because, well, I'd done a lot of pretty pictures, colorful pictures, um, but this was a huge problem. So I wanted a huge image that would differentiate. But as I recall, someone on this stage didn't want to put huge pictures in their museum. There must be a fifth person hating <laughs> over there. I'm sure if we carefully look over there and we give an applause, maybe he'll come up. Uh, um, I'd, love to, I'd love to go to this image here. Uh, maybe it's not um, the best for it, but I, I'd love to put, point out something that is important for me. And I go further and maybe I can, you can even see it. I'm not sure what is coming next here. I prepared the words, they prepared the picture, so it doesn't mean that it's co coherent. Yes, but you see this. And you see also the other picture. What I feel in, and what I feel in all your work, maybe not so much in the, whatever, in the German work, we will talk about this later, but in all your work, and if you look at that, that you play the role of a fool in this society, even in, even in the Western society. It's like the fool in, on the court, at the court of the Tsar or of the Emperor, there's one person who is allowed to dance around like a fawn, to be a harlequin figure. It's the only person who, with a lot of irony, maybe sometimes sarcasm, is allowed to say some true things. And when I see you on stage, even now, the way you explain things, I have the feeling, even today, your body language is still playing the role you, you played in the 70s and 80s and 90s in the Ukraine towards the system. No, probably your role changes depending on the situation you find yourself in. Это была роль, которая была связана с пониманием того, что если пришел капитализм, то должен быть и герой. Но герой тот, который приходил, он как бы был, который был при, социали... при социализме, он был, он был как бы положительный, и, и он уже он как бы подорван был, чем подорван постоянным показом и надоел. Но то есть его показывать положительно, показывать себя уже нельзя. Поэтому надо как бы иронично к себе показывать и отношения. Но вот это, но, но желание, но, но возможность показать себя, это тоже было, как можно сказать, вызываю огонь на себя. И когда там видели, оно, реакция была в России такая. Well, actually, yeah, I mean, I think, so roles change according to the time. And if you're saying that capitalism was going to come, 
if we're going to have capitalism, we needed to understand and we needed to have a hero. Who was the hero of capitalism? If you look at the socialist period, the, the very positive, super over positive heroes, well, we kind of had, uh, we'd kind of had a, enough of them. And, and they weren't convincing. And so there was a change in view. Uh, uh, you have to take a different view on this new hero. And I think that's where the irony came from, was seeing um, this in that light. Uh, because at the time, if you said, hey, I see it differently, you would draw fire immediately from the system. And uh, people didn't like to do that. But in this case, we wanted to, to, to go with that theme and so that the, the irony came out of that. We have to, unfortunately, we have to go in to and very soon, but I'd love to make a big jump. I'd love to make a big jump from this foolish self-portraits here, which are wonderful, which are incredible. And now I go to a series, I go through a lot of images, but then end up in a series of portraits, which Boris calls the German portraits. And that should be our last question for today. Uh, also, there's a lot of images which would be incredible to talk about and to look at them closer. And of course, they put in many more photographs than we expected, so at least for your eyes only. We're going forward. Now we are, you have in mind, you have in mind the series now of Boris, the way his body language is, and now look at these portraits. I'd love to, I'd love to talk with Boris about these portraits, which remind me a lot of Holbein, Granach, Quinton Macy, it reminds me of 14th century uh, paintings and um, they are so, so different to what we just seen. <laughs> Why did you photograph them all from the side? Why did you photograph them in profile? Why are they photographed in front of black? Why do they seem to be in, on the contrary to your, your body just before in front of the black photographs where you were a fawn dancing and here you have the feeling that we see trunks in front of us, like very sincere portraits. So your experience must have been rather different to make these photographs. Um, actually, I took them that way because I myself look better in profile. <laughs> but I prefer your smile when you look in my face. <laughs> It's not only about beauty, it's also about charm. Uh, есть немецкий портрет. Вот это чувство немецкого, это люди, можно сказать, ведь очень трудно, сейчас все смешалось, все смешалось. И найти что хоть что-то, какое как-то напоминание, оно, оно кажется мне было интересным. И мне кажется, что в этом отношении есть попытка какого-то портрета. Хотя идея это совершенно идиотская, искать там эти вставки. Но, но, но попытка интересная, и художник как бы имеет право попытаться. Actually, it, it was really, um, it just came, became interesting looking at it. Uh, we did these portraits with my wife, actually. We did these portraits for a theater. I didn't quite catch the name. A theater in Germany. And, and suddenly we realized that there was something extraordinary in it that was very German to us and, and, and something we wanted to understand there. We were looking for understanding. Um, in these German uh, portraits, uh, they, they just gave us this, this sense that there was something we'd recognize there. Uh, of course, it's ridiculous in a way because it's all mixed up and, and there's a lot of uh, different things in, in what is to be German today. Um, but it was an attempt, it was a searching, and you know, it's a bit silly in a way, what we tried to do or what I was trying to do. You might call it ridiculous, but well, as an artist, we have the right to try 
ridiculous things to try to find answers and, and look for ourselves. So that's what we were doing. What I really admire in this photograph is to see what we don't often see, that an artist in this age of being a little bit more than 20 years old, no, I'm joking, in his elderly part, in his in his elderly time, is still able to renew himself, to adapt himself to a new context. And it's fantastic to see that Boris Mikhailov is taking these pictures today after a lifetime of taking photographs. And I think that is worth an applause. Yeah. And I'm sure, I'm, wait a second, and I'm sure, Maybe you have a lot of questions, but the moderator of this talk has to catch a train. So you can ask the, photo, the photographer, his wife is here, the translator is here, and they are absolutely welcome to ask, to answer your questions. I wish you a nice afternoon.